Hi everyone, it's Rax. I have been working on this project for a long time and I'm happy to finally bring you the complete Greater Rift Guide. I also collaborated with some amazing Diablo 3 players to get their input to make sure this guide would have the critical information that you'll need and we'll have a special shout out for them at the end. We have no time to waste and a million topics to cover, so let's get started. Very quickly, let's go over the topics we're going to cover. There are going to be timestamps in the description of the video along with all the links that you'll need. First, we'll talk about preparing for greater rifts. Go over important stats, rerolling in gems, augmenting your followers setup, and what level you should be playing. We'll move into the mechanics, the maps, the mob types, the pylons, the elite affixes, the guardians, and crowd control. And finally, we'll combine all of that into the actual strategies on how to succeed in greater rifts how to fish, when to skip, the pylon tactics, the seasonal buff usage, guardian tips, solo speed and push, group speed and push, and the metas. On slides, you may see things highlighted in gold. Those are going to be major takeaways of things that you should definitely remember when you walk away from the video. Let's start out with some basics. There are tons of offensive stats that are important in clearing greater rifts. The ones on this screen are pretty self-explanatory. Your main stat depends on what character you're playing. It's strength for barbarians and crusaders, intelligence for necros, wizards, and witch doctors, and dexterity for monks and demon hunters. These stats can roll on every piece and give your character increased damage and survivability depending on which main stat you have. Strength and dexterity give you more armor, while int gives you more all resistance. This is why your Paragon level is so important to your character's power. Every level beyond Paragon 800 is going to give you 5 additional main stat, which gives you a lot of damage and survivability. And for your gear, you can get higher main stat values if they're ancient, or you'll get perfect values if they're primal ancient. Cooldown reduction is one of the most underrated stats. Diablo 3 typically revolves around keeping a major buff active at all times, like Wrath of the Berserker for a Barbarian, or Akarat's Champion for a Crusader. You should prioritize getting enough cooldown to keep these major buffs up at all times before you go for other stats. Crit hit chance and crit hit damage are in most ARPGs, and they work very well with each other. For most builds, they are two of the strongest stats to gain. Elemental damage is a rare attribute and it's incredibly powerful. So getting these rolls on your amulets and on your bracers is usually a top priority. Elite damage is more rare and less important than the other ones, but it's still a powerful stat if it happens to come on one of your legendaries. And finally, average damage, while usually not as good as crit hit damage or crit hit chance, is a great role, especially on Ancient Rings. Now let's talk about two more complicated offensive statistics. Attack speed makes your character attack faster, but it's important to understand that skills in Diablo 3 have breakpoints. The best way to explain this is with an example. The screenshot below is taken from D3 Planner for a Necromancer's Corpse Lance skill. The chart at the bottom shows how many frames the attack takes to cast on the left, while the right shows the attack speed you need to reach that value. Right now, my Necromancer is sitting just above 2.4 attacks per second, so my lances fire every 4 frames. I have just barely crossed the 2.40 breakpoint to make that happen. If I were to drop below 2.4 attacks per second on my character sheet, I would drop down to attacking every 5 frames, and according to the red number above in the chart, I would lose 20% damage in doing so. So there are a few takeaways from this. First is that any attack speed that I have on my character that brings me above 2.0 attacks per second, but does not allow me to reach the 2.4 breakpoint, doesn't actually make me attack faster or do more damage. So all of those rolls that were spent on attack speed could be used on something else. The second thing is reaching the next breakpoint can be a major damage increase. Or, conversely, barely missing a breakpoint can be a big damage loss. Understanding the breakpoints for your 
primary damage dealing skills is important and I would recommend researching these on d3planner.com under the skills and effects tab for your character. And one final note on attack speed is the attack speed roll on a weapon is multiplicative meaning that it is more powerful than the attack speed rolls on all the armor pieces which is additive. Now let's talk about area damage which is one of the most powerful stats in the game for builds that can gather and damage large groups of monsters. Area damage has a 20% chance to hit all monsters within 10 yards for the damage that you just dealt multiplied by your area damage value. Again, let's look at an example. If you have 90% area damage on your character and you hit 10 monsters with an attack that deals 100 damage, if all 10 of them procced area damage, you'd hit them for 100, which is your original hit, plus your hit again, 100, multiplied by your area damage, 90%, and then finally we multiply this by 9 because area damage can't proc on the monster itself. So we take 10 and subtract 1 and we're going to hit all of our 9 friends for a total of 910 damage. So take a moment to think about that for a second. You were originally going to hit every monster for 100, but area damage increased that to 910. And that's only with 90% area damage, and you can get a lot more than that. It has surreal potential to boost your character's power. And notice that if you have more than 100 area damage on your character, the area damage procs actually hit harder than your original skill. Remember that because area damage cannot proc on the monster itself, it's worthless for single target fights like Rift Guardians. And one big drawback of area damage is that it lags the game. So be careful when choosing to add this to your build. If you're playing a single target damage dealer or a support character, you should consider taking zero area damage, including removing it from your Paragon points so that the game runs smoothly. And in the middle right section of your screen, there is a diagram that shows you how big of a radius 10 yards is for how much damage it's going to be dealing. Now let's talk about defense. Vitality is the main way to boost your health pool, and you can always manipulate this value by changing your Paragon points. One mistake that many players make is thinking vitality is what's going to keep you alive. Mitigating damage can be just as, if not more important, than having a large health pool. Don't fall in love with stacking vitality. Focus on the other stats as well. And remember how main stats gave strength and the dexterity class's armor? That means as we get stronger, we'll have tons of armor and no all resistance. That's why it's important to stack the defense that your Paragon points cannot provide you. The same is true for int classes, which naturally get all resistance. They would need to stack armor for the bigger toughness boost. In general, whenever you get these rolls on belts, boots, and pants, take them. For other armor slots, we'll usually want the offensive rolls unless we're playing a support character. Life percentage is a good option to take on belts, but it's usually not great on other pieces, again, unless you're playing a support. It's the same concept as vitality. Don't fall in love with increasing your health pool, fall in love with damage mitigation. Life on hit is a great way to sustain your health, especially in solo. Usually one roll is enough, and it's typically taken on bracers or on a weapon. And finally, Reduced damage from elites is a nice roll on your chess piece if there's no offensive stat that your character needs to take. Now let's talk about the steps in re-rolling. The first thing that you ever want to do is the thing that we talked about earlier. Get enough cooldown reduction to keep up your main buff. Then you want to make sure that you have three sockets in your jewelry items because a legendary gem is always better than any other roll that you can get. Next, you want to get enough 
damage mitigation with all resistance and armor to survive. And then we'll take a life on hit roll, especially in solo on bracers or weapon, if you cannot sustain with your class otherwise. And then we need every roll of percent skill available. For example, for a whirlwind barb, any piece that can have percent ren damage needs to have it on there for a major damage increase. Then we want to stack as much crit hit chance, crit hit damage, and elemental damage as possible. And then again, as we talked about, we need enough attack speed to reach our desired breakpoint that we would research on D3 Planner. And then for some end game rerolling, we want to stack area damage if our build benefits from it, if we're going to gather a bunch of monsters and blow them all up. We could remove the main stat rolls for elite and average damage, but that's typically only done at very high paragon levels, I'm talking thousands of paragon levels. Then we could remove most of our vitality rolls for other offensive stats, and we can always pick up more vitality in our paragon. And then finally, we could focus on secondary stats. We could get reduced damage or resistances or increased pickup, which would increase our quality of life. Now let's talk about gemming and augmenting our character. The first thing that you should always level is your main gems first until they require a 30% chance and then you can stop until you get more powerful and then you could raise the GR level and then increase your chance to upgrade them. You want to level your augment gems one at a time to at least 80 and that's because we want to augment our gear immediately starting with your best piece the second that your gem is leveled up as high as you can reasonably make it. This is because augments give your character a tremendous boost in power, especially at low paragon levels. You always want to augment your character with the main stat, strength, dex, or intelligence, unless you're playing a support class. Then you would do the opposite stat, similar to what we talked about in the defense section. So strength and dexterity classes would augment int for supporting, while intelligence classes would augment either strength or dex, because augmenting int for strength and dex would give them all resist, and augmenting strength or dex on intelligence classes would give them armor. Never augment vitality. That's never the way to go. Can you tell I'm not a big fan of vitality? After your main gems and your augments are ready to go, then level your support gems to level 25, even if you don't plan on making a support character right away. If you ever want to jump into that role, you want those gems ready to go. Now you're free to level whatever you want, and you can make better augs to override your original ones. Yes, you can override the original augments. And always socket a diamond in your helm for the cooldown reduction. Occasionally, some builds will use the resource cost reduction gem or sometimes they'll use the increased life gem but most builds opt for the diamond in the helmet and almost always socket your main stat gems in your chest and pants or diamonds for defense the only time you don't want diamonds for defense is if you're playing an in class and you have very high paragon levels then you could gem emeralds or rubies for armor now it's time for me to share a trick. I'm going to show you the easiest way to get augment gems. First, open a game to do some greater rifts and do not leave this game. We're going to stay in this game the whole time. So drop any gem that you'd like to use as an augment gem on the floor in town and make sure it's a gem that can level to 150 and try to use one that's not used very often. If you want one to use, try Miranade Teardrop of the Star Weir. So just throw it on the ground. Then complete a Greater Rift, and at the end of the Greater Rift, it's going to think that you don't have a Miranade because it's sitting on the ground in town, and it'll give you a new one. Perfect. Pick it up, close the Greater Rift, and then throw that new Miranade also on the ground next to your first one. And then do another Greater Rift. It's going to give you a third Miranade. Throw it on the ground. Do another Greater Rift. It's going to give you a fourth one. Throw it on the ground. After you do 10 speed Greater Rifts, you're going to have 10 Miranades laying on the ground. 
pick up all 10 of them, and now you have some very easy gems and some very identifiable gems that you know are used as your augments, so you don't actually use one of your main gems and then say, oh wow, now I don't have my main gem because I just ate it for an augment. Now let's set up your follower. The main thing to decide between the Templar, Scoundrel, and Enchantress is what final buff would you like to have. The Templar gives increased resources, the Scoundrel gives crit hit chance, and the Enchantress gives you attack speed. To be completely honest with you, it doesn't make much of a difference which one you use. I always use the Templar for no good reason at all. When picking skills for your follower, always pick the ones that do not crowd control. You'll understand why when we get to the crowd control section later in the video. You can see the highlighted skills for each follower that I would select. And note, for the Enchantress, don't pick either of the first skills as they both crowd control the monsters. Now on to the gear. This may surprise you, but 99% of a follower's value comes from three items. The Cannot Die Relic, which is easy to craft at the blacksmith, and then you would upgrade it with Recipe 3 and Kanai's Cube. It's very easy to obtain. An Oculus Ring, which will give you a plus 85% damage ring to stand in after you kill an enemy. And a Unity Ring, so you can wear one and take half damage. Your follower, no matter how well you gear them, does no damage. So their only benefit to you is giving you buffs and occasionally taking some hits for you. If you want your follower to occasionally gather enemies together for you, like if you're using an area damage build for example, then you can give them an S of Johan amulet. And if you're okay with your follower CCing the monsters to help you stay alive, you can give them a Thunder Fury Sword, a Freeze of Deflection Shield, and a Word Ward Ring. Now for the question that I've been asked the most, what greater lift level should you be playing at? Unless you're pushing for a new record, you should do the highest Greater Rift level that you can complete every time in under 3 minutes. Every time you increase a GR level, the monsters gain 17% health, but only give you 5% more experience. That is not a forgiving ratio at all. So to illustrate this, you guessed it, let's look at an example. Let's compare running a GR 100 in 3 minutes versus a GR 105 in 5. So looking at the table below, if you're frightened by the fact that increasing a GR level 5 tiers more than doubles their health, you're not alone. And for a measly 28% more experience, it doesn't seem worth it. Assuming that we took absolutely no breaks and blasted for a straight hour, we would have completed 8 extra greater rifts, we would have gained almost 33% more experience and received nearly double the gem ups and legendaries. Simply put, it's not even close. I cringe every time I watch teams suffering through greater rifts that they can barely clear thinking that it's helping them. It isn't. And when you're doing speed greater rifts, it's much easier to survive since you'll be one-shotting everything. And you'll also be getting far more blood shards from Kadala, so you can fill your inventories with a sea of worthless yellows that you can salvage. Now we've arrived at the mechanics section, and we'll start with the map tiles in Greater Rifts. First, let's understand what we want and don't want in a map. We want wide open spaces to gather large groups of enemies, so any map with rooms or doors or twists and turns is automatically out. Next, we want a lot of density, so we can make a ton of progress once we do get a great map. The best maps can be four corner, which is just another way of saying it has a square layout. This is advantageous over a straight line because we can pull enemies from multiple directions, resulting in larger packs and faster clears. Finally, we want maps with many pylon spawns, so we have multiple chances to get that juicy conduit. Put all of that together and we have the map tier list. In the S tier, we have Festering Woods, Battlefields, and some Silver Spires. These are the best maps in the game. Silver Spires can be incredibly short or have a lot of bridges, which we want nothing to do with. Almost every rank 1 clear comes from one of these three maps in some form or another. 
In the A tier, we have Howling Plateau, Shrouded Moors, Stinging Winds, and Some Craters. For the most part, these are wide open maps, they just don't have the density that the S tier maps have. B tier maps are playable, but aren't anything special. Plague Tunnels can be amazing if you get the infinite donuts layout, which is just circle after circle after circle. And Pandemonium always has two rooms you can fight in, and the Brown Caves can have these giant rooms which you can make good progress in. Coming in in the C tier is just everything mediocre, it's just everything not listed in this tier list. And finally, F tier for pushing, opening up a key and seeing one of these as your first map is an instant leave. They are compartmentalized, narrow, non-dense, garbage maps that you can almost never make any progress on without a pylon's assistance. On to the different mob types in Greater Rifts. There are many different combinations of monsters you'll encounter, and you can diagnose which mob set you have very quickly if you've memorized the best and the worst combinations. Each mob type has a specific value they give toward advancing your progress bar. The more progression they give, the better, unless their HP is so high that it's not worth killing them. Density is a major factor in how good a mob type is. If you have the most valuable monster in the world, but you only see three of them on the map, it's not worth it. The map you're playing has a big influence on how dense these mob types will be. Another big part is how well the monsters will follow you. You usually want to fight in big open areas, and if the monsters won't follow you, you'll either lose a lot of time bringing them, or have to skip them and lose that progression. Finally, how dangerous the monsters are has a big impact on your clear. If you can't survive against them, it doesn't matter how valuable they are, you're going to have to skip the floor or leave the rift entirely. At the top, with warpath.eu, is a great resource for understanding mob types and progression. Blizzard has made some changes to these values and mob sets, so don't rely on it 100%, but it's still a great baseline, and this link along with many others will be in the description for you to click on. Let's learn what the best mob types are in Diablo 3. There are still going to be great mob types not listed here, and it will depend on several factors, like if you're playing solo or groups, or if you're playing hardcore or softcore, but in general, I tried to pick eight of the best mob sets for any situation. Transformers. These start as dark vessels praying in the corner and after a few seconds transform into unholy thralls. Nothing will fill your progress bar faster than these mob types, and if you get good density on a festering woods, you can actually clear an entire greater rift on a single floor with them. They have a ton of HP and they're tough to kill, so be careful but they're absolutely worth it. Dark Hellions are known as God Comp in the D3 community for a reason. They have outrageous density, they're easy to stack, they give amazing progress, and they're just overall an unbelievable mob type. File Swarms are amazing because they will follow you anywhere. Get their attention and run to the big room or wherever you want to fight, and a giant clump of monsters will just magically form. Many rank 1 clears come with this mob type, including the rank 1 4 player video I posted just a few days ago. Lacuni phase beasts are amazing because they give insane progress, and they have wretched mothers who throw up zombies that fill up your map. If you get this mob type, locate the mothers and fight close to them for the fastest clears so you can get as many zombies as possible. Armored destroyers, aka chickens, are another amazing mob type. They're dense, valuable, non-lethal, and easy to kite around. Overall, they're one of the easiest mob types to play in the game. Small spiders are incredible because they can have such high density. Combine that with very low HP and being fairly harmless, except for the spear chuckers, this is a great mob type to play for squishy builds. Grotesque plus Punisher is another very valuable mob type. You just have to be careful to dodge the explosions. They have claimed many lives, and you don't want to be next. And last but not least, we have summoners. Any mob that's going to generate more mobs for you is always a win. The summoner charger comp is one of the best in the entire game. Just let them do their thing. And now for the worst mobs, which you should be terrified to see in your greater rifts. More lose and hell witches. 
I cannot explain to you how bad this mob type is. It's worth nothing, it's hard to kill, it's hard to group, it's hard to kite, and it's dangerous. We never want to see these, ever. Toxic lurkers, or better known in the community as big booties. Big booties are great in real life, but they are terrible in Diablo 3. They're quite valuable, but so hard to kill that they're not worth it, unless of course you have a conduit pylon. Oppressors and Hell Witches fall into the same category as Morlus. They're just terrible, and they're not worth it at all. Dark Berserkers have insane HP, they can one-shot you, and their progression is mediocre at best. It's simply not worth trying to kill them. Blazing Guardians. Goodbye, my friend. It was nice knowing you. You're dead. And Licky Tongues and Snakes. They're impossible to group, they're very dangerous, and not valuable. Just cry and leave when you see them. And the same comment goes here as for the best mob types. There are other terrible ones in the game, like Unburieds, for example, based on what spec and game mode you're playing. Now for the exciting stuff. Let's talk about pylons. Note that there is an extremely powerful amulet in the game called Flavor of Time that doubles the duration for all pylons. This is one of the strongest amulets in the game and is taken by many builds in Diablo 3. Here we're going to talk about the mechanics of pylons and later in the video we'll discuss all the strategies around using them. Channeling lasts for 30 seconds or 60 if you have a flavor of time and the buff is it will give you 75% cooldown reduction and spells are free to cast unless you're casting a spell that uses your entire resource pool. You typically want to take this after you've depleted all of your resources, because your resources are now free to cast, and you've used your major cooldowns. Conduit lasts 30 seconds or 60 seconds with a flavor of time, which is ridiculous. You will electrocute monsters around you, and it scales with greater rift level, not with your damage level, so a support character will do the same amount of damage as a damage dealing character in a greater rift and it can strike between 5 to 10 monsters at a time. Typically want to take this after you've gathered many elites by the pylon and have eliminated or severely damaged the surrounding trash. Power Pylon. Lasts for 30 seconds or 60 if you have a flavor of time. It increases your damage by 250%. Some sources on the internet say it's 400, but after collaborating with a lot of top players, we believe it's 250%. But no matter what the percentage is, it makes you do way more damage. And you typically want to take this before your convention of the elements cycle when your cooldowns are up and on the Rift Guardian after stacking Stricken. We'll talk more about convention of the elements in a minute if you don't know what that is. The Shield Pylon lasts 60 seconds or 2 minutes if you have a flavor of time. And the buff is it makes you immune to all damage and crowd control except Wormhole, which is kind of annoying. You want to take after pulling a giant pack of monsters together or in conjunction with a second pylon to guarantee you can stay alive and deal massive damage. Last but not least, speed pylon, which lasts 60 seconds or 2 minutes if you've got a flavor of time, will increase your movement speed by 100%, your attack speed by 30%, and it will grant you the ability to walk through walls and knock back monsters. You want to take this to stack Stricken on a boss, or to skip an entire floor, but you do not want to take this when you need to group monsters, because running through enemies and knocking them back with a speed pylon is a lot of crowd control. We'll get to that in a moment when we get to the crowd control section. And now for more information on pylons. Pylons have predetermined spawn points where they can appear on a map. After playing the game long enough, you will start memorizing where pylons can and can't be. Becoming familiar with where they spawn, especially on S-tier maps, is critical. The chance to spawn a pylon increases by roughly, keyword roughly, 3% for every 1% progression you get in a rift, and you start the rift with a 1% chance to spawn a pylon at no progress meaning there is a small chance to spawn a pylon immediately when you walk in. My favorite? Let's look at an example. If we cleared 17% of a rift and then checked a pylon spawn, we'd have a 1% chance, which is our initial chance walking in, plus 17% times 3, which would be a 52% chance 
that that spawn would give us a pylon. If we got one, our chances would reset to zero and we'd have to make more progress before getting another one, meaning we won't spawn pylons back to back and you're going to have to kill some more monsters to spawn the next one. We'll cover the strategies on manipulating this in just a bit. So some more information on pylons. You get two to four pylons every greater rift, and you can actually lose a pylon if you make too much progression before checking a pylon spawn. So if the rift decided that you were going to get three pylons in your particular run, but you waited until 80% progression to check a spawn, you can actually lose one of them. You cannot get the same pylon twice, so if you had a conduit previously, you won't get another. Once a Rift Guardian spawns, no pylons will spawn. And once a pylon spawn is revealed, the outcome will not change, meaning a pylon is not going to magically appear there later as you get more progress. If you didn't get one, it's done. There will never be one there. Now let's look at some important elite affixes. I'll let you glance through most of these that I'm sure we're familiar with, but I'd like to talk through five of them. Health link can actually be beneficial for us because elites will stay alive until they're all dead. We can continue AoEing them and proccing area damage to get them and the trash around them down faster. Juggernaut is a terrible affix because we cannot crowd control them which can significantly reduce our damage and makes it very hard to move them. Take, for example, the Heaven's Fury Crusader, who deals massive damage to blinded enemies. Since we cannot blind Juggernauts, we do no damage to them. Shielding can only appear on one monster in the pack at a time, so we need to do damage to a non-shielded target when that happens. If there is only one monster left, they will no longer be able to shield. Waller, aka the bane of my existence, can severely nerf your skills, damage, grouping of enemies, movement, and ability to escape. This is why I always wear a potion of Kool-Aid, which can break walls. And finally, Wormhole, getting teleported to a random location you didn't want to be can interrupt your DPS cycle or just flat out kill you. Be careful when stepping into one. On to Rift Guardians, which are the bosses at the end of a Greater Rift. Bane of the Stricken is usually needed to kill Rift Guardians in high Greater Rift levels because they have so much health. Stricken makes each successive attack deal more damage, which can add up quickly if you attack very fast. Some Guardians spawn adds, which can be the dream or a nightmare. On one hand, adds are amazing for AoE and area damage and even spawning Oculus Rings, but they are terrible for stacking Stricken, as Stricken only applies on the first monster it hits. This means around adds, you should always try to hit the boss first so the Stricken stack applies to him. Some Guardians have an add cap, meaning there's a limit to how many friends they can summon, like Crusader King and Escandiel. On these bosses, once they're done summoning, you can simply run to the other side of the map and have them teleport to you to avoid their adds entirely. Recognize that many Rift Guardian attacks can be interrupted, so plan those skills wisely. And finally, many Rift Guardians enrage at certain percentages, which can unlock more powerful abilities. Check the video description for a link to every Rift Guardian's wiki page to learn more about them. Now for a very important subject that seems to fly under the radar for many Diablo players. Crowd control. Diablo 3 has two types of them, hard and soft. A hard CC is something that makes the monsters unable to move or attack, including blind, charm, fear, freeze, and stun. Each time you hit a monster with a hard CC, it builds their resistance to further crowd controls by 10% for every second that they were incapacitated. When they come out of that CC, their resistance will drop by 5% for every second that you leave them alone. Knockbacks and pulls are also considered a hard CC and apply a flat 40% resistance rather than basing it on a timer. Soft CCs, on the other hand, can be reapplied continuously and don't impact hard CCs at all. There are a few takeaways from this. First, we don't want random hard CCs to occur 
because it will build the monster's resistances to them and may make them immune when we actually want to cast our own crowd controls. This is why we do not recommend taking crowd controls on your follower. We don't want to spam our hard CCs either because monsters will become immune very quickly. And finally, leaving monsters alone for a while will allow us to CC them freely when we need to. Be aware of the hard CCs that your build is using and plan them accordingly. And remember, in group settings, there may be multiple players with hard CCs and synergizing them is important to your success. We have arrived at the strategy section of the video where we will put all of our knowledge about greater rifts together to get the most out of Diablo 3. Let's begin with map fishing. By a mile, the biggest reason why people don't get high clears is because they don't fish for a good map with good mobs. It's not the most exciting way to play the game, but it's the only way to see what you can really accomplish. Playing hours and hours of bad maps with bad mob types is only going to frustrate you, waste your time, and probably not net you a clear. We need to farm a ton of keys, and by a ton I mean at least 100, and then let the RNG begin. What we are looking for is simple. An S tier map, either festering, battlefields, or a silver spire, with a good mob type. You can expect to get something playable around every 20 or 30 keys, and you will only know the true potential of your character and build when you've tested it on the best maps possible. You may not need a perfect rift, meaning you don't also have to get a conduit pylon and a godly follow-up, but at least fish for a very good first floor when pushing. And an important note, this only applies when you're pushing for a new personal best or trying to increase your rank on the leaderboards. Fishing is never required when running speed greater rifts. There is an art only known by the wisest and bravest Diablo 3 players when to skip something. After you have your godly first floor and you have a decent lead, what are the chances that the very next map is something great that you can continue making progress on? Not good. Depending on a map's size, it can take between 15 to 90 seconds to skip an entire floor but that can be far less detrimental than trying to make something work with terrible mobs on a terrible map. So keep some things in mind when deciding to skip or not. First, how much progress do you need to finish? If it's not much and you can get it clear with what you've got, then just stay and finish the rift. We're only skipping when we have to. Second is pay attention to the elites that you're skipping. Are they easy to kill? Do they have good affixes? well then it might be worth staying. If it's a yellow wormhole walling juggernaut, dismiss them from class and move on. Also pay attention to the density. Sometimes bad mob types can still work if there's enough of them. And finally pay attention to the pylons. If you have a mob that you can't kill but you spawn a power pylon, well maybe you can stay now. And conversely, if you don't want to spawn a pylon on this bad map, then skip it. There is no magic answer on when to skip or not, but it's something you should always be considering when you're in rough situations. All right, everyone, now we're getting to some very exciting stuff, pylon tactics. We're not gonna go through one example. We're not gonna go through two. We're gonna go through seven different situations where you can use a pylon intelligently to your advantage to get a better greater if clear. In the first example, we're gonna cover delaying a pylon. So let's say we're on a festering woods and we just spawn a conduit in the middle of the map and we've got everything on us and all the elites. The only thing that we haven't looked at is the end room, which has a pylon spawn that we haven't discovered yet. When we take the conduit, we're going to kill everything. We're going to kill all the elites on us. And after we pick up all the globes from that progress, when we go into that end room, we are going to spawn another pylon there. We do not want that to happen because when the pylon spawns, it's going to be on an empty map. We're going to have to take it and then go next and not get as much value out of it. So what we will do is we will run to the end of the map and we're going to break that pylon spawn in the end room and then take the conduit. Now, when we go to the next floor, 
the next pylon will spawn there and we'll be able to use it there much better. So in the second example, let's cover generating a pylon. Let's say we're playing on a howling plateau and we have 25% progress near the end room and we know that that has a pylon spawn. But we know if we get the progress to 33%, remember it's roughly three times whatever percentage you are at chance to get a pylon. So at 25% chance times three, there's roughly a 75% chance that that last pylon spawn will be there. If we just take a moment to kill a little bit of trash and try to get it closer to 33 and then go check the end room, then we have a much bigger chance of getting that conduit that we're looking for, zap everything, and then go next map with a giant lead. The next example is similar to the previous one, but this time we're going to generate a pylon on the next map. So let's say we're on a festering woods and we dragged all the elites to the end and we uncovered the last pylon spawn and we didn't get one. And we estimate it's been about 20% progress since our last pylon. Instead of just giving up and going next map and continuing on, maybe the first pylon spawn on the next floor will give us a conduit, but remember we're going to have to make some further progress in order to make that happen. So we will fight in the end room for a while, we'll kill whatever is reasonable, and then go next and pray for a conduit which we would take to go back and melt all of the elites. Now let's talk about generating a pylon at 99% progress. Let's say we're playing at battlefields and we have a conduit and we killed the final elite to spawn the boss and all the progression orbs are on the ground. All we gotta do is pick them up. Don't take all of them. Only take enough orbs, and by the way, they're worth about 1.15% progression. Only take enough orbs to bring your progress to 98 or 99%, and then run ahead to the next pylon spawn to see if you can get a pylon for the boss. If you get a power pylon, your Rift Guardian killer, your RGK, is going to be very, very happy with you. And finally, skipping a pylon, if you're playing a four-player Greater Rift and you spawn a speed in the middle of a festering, we always completely skip this pylon because when everyone has speed, it knocks back all the monsters. Remember a few slides ago, hard CC, it will make it impossible to group them and it's just simply not worth it. In that case, we would just completely skip the pylon. For our last two examples, let's talk about ways to save a pylon. Because contrary to popular belief, you don't have to immediately click a pylon when you see it. For example 6, let's say you're at 90% progress on a good map, good mobs, with good density, and you spawn a power pylon. Don't take it right away. Finish the rift since everything is already going very well, and the RGK after they stack a bit of stricken is going to love that power pylon and they're going to vaporize the rift guardian for you. And what about saving a pylon on a previous map? Let's say you were playing a festering and you had a conduit and you got your bar all the way to 85% and at the end of the map as you were leaving, you accidentally spawned a power pylon. Don't take it and go next floor and get the last 15% of your rift. And when the guardian spawns, have your whole team run to the beginning of that floor, go back and take the power pylon for the Rift Guardian Killer, and then you'll be able to have that for the boss. So the main things that you want to be keeping in mind when you're playing Greater Rifts about pylons is which pylon spawns are coming up? Do you want a pylon to spawn here or next map? If you want it to spawn here, make sure you have as much progression as possible before checking it. And if you want it next map, then break the pylon spawn right now which pylons are left, because you can only get each pylon one time. How much progress have you made since the last pylon? 33% is the amount you should look for to be guaranteed a spawn. And how am I going to use the different pylons if they spawn? Am I going to take it immediately? Am I going to gather the elites and then take it? Am I going to skip it? Am I going to save it for boss? Or some other option? Now let's talk about the seasonal buffs in a general sense because I want this video to be applicable no matter what season of Diablo that we're in. But in general, 
especially as of lately, these powers can propel your characters to greater rift levels far beyond what they would normally be able to do. It's very important to completely understand and take advantage of all that they offer you. A lot of people think that you can read the patch notes and read what it does and have a full understanding of how to use the buff. I promise you that that is never true. You've got to get on the public test realm and try it, or at a minimum, watch some YouTubers or streamers and get their thoughts on exactly what you can do with these powers. So let's take a few examples. Season 18 was the Triune buff, and it had outrageous synergy between the cooldown reduction circle and the power circle. You could sit in a cooldown circle and not put cooldown rolls on your character to bring back a very long cooldown or a very big attack. And then once you brought that back, you could jump into the pink power ring and just erase all of the monsters. Once you were able to recognize that and plan accordingly for that, you had much, much greater power. In Season 19, currently in Pandemonium, you can adjust your kill streaks to absolutely tomahawk a room full of elites. The geysers, the chests, the meteor showers, and the angels can literally cut your greater of time in half. And it's like having two or three extra conduit pylons per greater rift. And where you take those conduit pylons, preferably around a lot of elites, has a big impact on what you're able to clear. You don't have to figure this all out yourself, as we mentioned earlier. Check all the resources, check Twitter, Reddit, YouTube, Twitch, read the patch notes, read the forums. And that's how you're going to know exactly how the seasonal buffs are going to help you in the future. Now let's dive into more Guardian tips. First of all, before you spawn them, have an idea of where you'd like to fight them. And usually just by running to wherever you want them to be, they'll follow you or teleport to you. Know what kind of boss you're looking for. Know if you're looking for a single target boss or an ad boss. And know if there are certain bosses that you absolutely can't fight or stay alive on. Because knowing that ahead of time, you can just leave if they spawn. Plan which moves you're going to interrupt. Again, I will have a link to all the Guardian's Wikipedia pages, and I would recommend, if not looking up all of them, look up the ones who give you trouble. That way you can know if there are any moves that you can avoid with your CCs. Know their enrage percentages and move changes, because that's important. And you can use your follower or pets as a shield if you need to survive. And know your damage dealing rotation especially around your convention of the elements cycle. Now in the top right corner, you can see the convention of the elements ring. This is a staple in most damage dealing builds. And for your main attack, whenever it goes into the appropriate element, you're going to deal 200% extra damage for four seconds. It's very important that you know exactly what you're going to do during that and right before it. Know your rotation. Be aware of the timer. If you're about out of time, feel free to take some additional risks. Just be careful in hardcore. Otherwise, dodging the attacks and staying alive is almost always the best option for getting the Guardian down. And finally, plan your pylons. Take speed immediately to stack Stricken. Take channeling after you've stacked Stricken once your cooldowns are down, because taking channeling will bring your cooldowns back and they'll give you infinite resource. Take shield after your cheat death is activated. That way you can stay alive. Take power after you've stacked stricken and before your important convention of the elements cycle when your cooldowns are up. And finally, take conduit before your cheat death activates and try to use it to spawn an Oculus Ring from the ads. Now let's talk about solo specifically and some of the differences between doing speeds and pushing. In speeds, you can start with any amount of keys, it doesn't matter. But remember, when we're pushing, we need 100 plus keys because we're going to be fishing. For speeds, you want to prioritize speed of your character along with damage. And for pushing, you want to prioritize survivability and damage. Because when you get into those high greater rift levels, the monsters are going to hurt. In a speed, you would play every map and every mob type and for pushing, we're looking for S-tier maps with good mobs. In speeds, all that pylon stuff is not needed. 
just go ahead and click them all immediately, unless of course you're getting toward the Guardian. And for pushing, you must plan your pylons carefully. We went over a lot of examples on how doing different things can dramatically alter your greater rift. In speeds, it is critical. Finish every GR in under three minutes. If you are taking longer than three minutes, lower it. I promise you it's going to give you more Paragon levels and more Legendaries. Again, for speeds, try to complete two or three before gambling. You don't have to gamble after every single Greater Rift. Let your Blood Shards build up, and doing more Greater Rifts and less gambling is again going to give you more out of it. And one more thing for speeds is pickup radius is going to increase how fast you can do these rifts because picking up those orbs quickly surprisingly can actually help you. And a few more things for pushing. Min-max every single roll on your gear and augment before you start doing your big push. And a big hint on solo is you can pause the game and strategize. If you get a pylon, feel free to hit escape and pause and think about what you want to do with it based on your situation. You can also pause the game to let the game catch up on lag. And finally, a lot of people tell me that they're not sure how high they can push. Well, if you're opening Greater Rift 115 and you're not sure if you can do it, you'll know if you can do it or not when you get a Festering Woods with a good map with a conduit. If you get all three of those things and you're nowhere near able to clear it, then that's probably too high. But if you get all of those things and you have a gigantic lead, then you can definitely get it down. And one final hint for solo players is remember that you don't have to play solo. If you enjoy playing solo, then that's absolutely what you should do. But there are a lot of communities and clans and ways that you can meet other people. And a lot of people are probably looking for other players to play with just like yourself. Teaming up can be extremely rewarding and you can make new friends. Now let's look at some hints for group play, starting with speeds. One of the most helpful hints is to pick a leader and follow them. Four people doing their own thing almost never works. If you have someone leading where to go and where to fight, it will be a smoother process for all involved. Bring supports and DPS as they synergize very well with each other. If all four players refuse to play anything except Whirlwind Barb, you won't clear as high. Make a support and a DPS yourself so you can fill multiple roles. Along those same lines, bring different classes and bring movement speed buffs so you can zip through everything quickly. If you're lucky enough to have a Z-Monk in your party who can shield everyone, equip Squirt's Necklace, which gives you double damage as long as you haven't been hit. Stay together as a team because you will clear much slower if you split up and someone needs to wear Nemesis Bracers, which will spawn an Elite from every pylon. And just like in Solo, finish every GR in under 3 minutes and gamble every 2 or 3 rifts. For pushing, start with 100 plus keys and fish as a team. You will need a mixture of support and DPS, along with a trash killer and a boss killer, commonly referred to as an RGK or a Rift Guardian killer. We of course are looking for an S tier map with good mobs and we will create giant packs in the open areas to mow everything down. As we just discussed in great detail, planning your pylons carefully will make the difference between a clear and a fail. Discuss the strategies with your team and execute them properly. For two player, I would recommend playing with one support and one DPS. The support is necessary for keeping the DPS alive and it will allow you both to clear higher than using two DPS. For three player, you can use either one support and two DPS, or two supports with one DPS. The main question you need to answer is, can the DPS clear both the Rift and the Guardian by themselves if you choose to use one? I can tell you there are very few classes that can do that currently, but it's possible Blizzard will release more in the future. And finally, for four player, I wouldn't bring any less than two supports. Two support and two DPS is by far the most common, but if there's a class so strong that they can solo everything, you could consider bringing three supports. And a few words of wisdom on group play in general, communicate. Teams who discuss strategies and agree on tactics 
can clear way higher than the ones who don't. Speak up, but be respectful while doing it. And speaking of being respectful, never insult your teammates, ever. It gains you nothing and only has the potential to ruin things for you. For our final topic, let's look at what the current meta team looks like. And meta stands for most effective tactic available. This is usually done as a four player team for more loot and experience, but it can change from season to season as Blizzard adjusts class balance. The main takeaway here is seeing how the team itself is structured so you can use similar ideas in building your own teams in the future. For the first support, we're bringing a Z monk and the Z stands for zero, meaning that they deal zero damage. It's just a quick way to say it's a support monk. They are incredibly strong because they can shield and heal to protect Squirt's necklace, which you can see on the right. For the second support, we bring a Z-Barb, which can pull monsters to big open areas and gather them together. This allows the DPS to deal massive AoE and area damage to erase entire rooms. The main DPS is a Bazooka Wizard, which will be nerfed for next season so something else will take its place. This character takes full damage, including as much area damage as possible, and just enough survivability to keep Squirt's necklace up. They are responsible for clearing the entire rift, but they're mostly useless on the Guardian unless the Guardian spawns a lot of adds. And the final piece of the puzzle is the RGK, which is currently filled with a Crusader, but could also be done by a Necromancer or a Demon Hunter. Their responsibility during the rift is to help the Barbarian gather monsters, and they are the only one at the end who can kill the Guardian. So their itemization is based around dealing massive single target damage and stacking Stricken as quickly as possible. Wow, it's finally over. This video was by a mile the biggest undertaking I've taken in my gaming career. I couldn't have done it alone, so let me take a moment to shout out all the talented players who looked through this with me. Big thanks to Seven, Broken String, CG, Fusk, Saw, Vanquish, Wario, and Wudijo for all their thoughts, ideas, and input. All of their Twitch streams are linked on this page and will be in the description of the video. Please go throw them a follow, guys. And please let me know in the comments what you thought about this video. Did it help? Did it give you new ideas to approach the game? Are there any lingering questions that you need help with? I will read every comment like I do for every single video. Thank you all and good luck to you in Diablo 3 and beyond.